emotionally healthy children and how to raise them in a Christ, uh, to be Christ-centered. Okay, so how would we do that in like 30 minutes? <laughs> uh, very swiftly, I suppose. So uh, asking open-ended questions, and you probably know what that means already, but just wanted to go really in detail a little bit of how simple and powerful a way it is to learn about your child's thoughts and theories and interests and to develop their, um, continue into their development. And interestingly, if you continue to practice this all throughout their um, first 18 years of life, it also develops your own communication skills, actually. Oh yeah, right there. Now, um, there are differences between the closed-ended and the open-ended. Uh, for example, closed-ended questions are answered in one or two words, um, often prompting like a yes or no answer, or right or wrong answer. Do you like apples? Yes or no. What color are you using them? Brown. It just stops right there, right? But open-ended questions encourage a child to think deeper and more broadly and communicate more. And they have to. What do you like about apples? They might just say, I don't know, but uh, that is an open-ended question. Or, why did you choose that color? Now, this is not to say that you should never use closed-ended questions. I mean, you have to get through the day, right? Do you want chicken nuggets or hot dogs, right? <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do that. But whenever possible, like during playtime or uh, conversations, we have to kind of be a little bit more intentional about open-ended open questions. So, there are benefits to this, and I'm just gonna whiz through that it could boost critical thinking, it could increase creative thinking, actually, um, and encourages communication, uh, but especially, I thought this was interesting, that it could empower and really increase their confidence. Oh, am I going too fast? Oh, there you go, sorry. So, the confidence, uh, because it, empowers them to express themselves and build self-confidence by sharing their thoughts and knowing that they're going to be heard and that we're just kind of interested in what their ideas are or what they're thinking about. All right, so, but when is their time, right? Our schedules are so busy and it looks like our kids' schedules are busier. When I look at the kids, especially the ones that I'm serving, and they tell me about what their day is like, I didn't do anything on Saturday <laughs> growing up, right? Uh, so, but it's very, very amazing how even a five minute conversation, how much you can get out of that. Um, and sometimes we have to intentionally plan it because you have to have those questions in mind. It could be awkward, but it will be worth it. Um, so since our children typically won't be the first ones to ask us open and new questions, um, we would have to be prepared with age-appropriate questions. So for example, for young children, like during their playtime, and I'm sure you might be playing for at least five to 10 minutes with them here and there, you can um, say, for example, instead of, do you want to play Uno? Right? Um, it would be more like, what shall we play today? And why did you choose that game? They might just kind of scratch their heads like, uh, because I want to. <laughs> um, but you can kind of, initiate those things until you get an answer from them. For older children, um, for example, during a car ride home, during that long line that you're, you guys are talking about, um, instead of, how was your day? Which is very common, right? But a lot of times they're like, fine, good. Sometimes you can use something even deeper and more open-ended, like, what was the best part of your day? And why? And then you can follow up with, Uh, for teens, during longer car rides, meal times, or long walks together, um, those are good opportunities and where you can um, say things like, for example, a close-ended question would be, hey, what's considered trendy these days? And they might know that you're trying to create a conversation, but they at least can tell you're trying. And after they say that, like TikTok, for example, they say, so why? Why, why is that so trendy? Like really being curious about that. Or who's your favorite friend to hang out with? And what makes that friend your favorite? 
Or what would your friends say about you? That one is a good one because it also tests to see what uh, their self-esteem is like. Okay, so after you ask a question, you have to wait, right? Um, and not only wait as many seconds as you can tolerate, but even be ready with a follow-up question. Uh, because a lot of times they're gonna say, I don't know. You have to be on your feet and like ask the next related topic, right? And once you've posed an open-ended question, it's important to give your child the time to think about what your question means and to develop their response. Uh, because by waiting, you're letting them know um, that you're looking for their thoughts and their ideas, not a particular specific answer. Um, and if they're making you wait, try not to be tempted to go back to looking at your phone, right? Um, because that doesn't share the message that you really want to know their answer. And if you interject, or correct, or debate, because maybe you don't like their answer, that could be possible. Um, if that interjection happens or interruption happens, Sometimes they may feel you just have an agenda uh, to fulfill about this conversation. Also, especially for older teens, the young and older teens, we have to be sensitive that they just might not want, if they're not in the mood to chit chat. Right? So if you're feeling that, then back out and don't be discouraged and just wait for another opportunity because it, it will come. Now, um, these are two websites that I found, and I know you're supposed to click on it, so we can give you these slides if you like, um, where I found a whole list of creative ways to ask questions, and age-appropriate ones, for younger kids and teens. So this is what's kind of cool and neat. So maybe I'll ask Mr. Choi to give that to you. Now I'm going to invite our next quick speaker, um, Neil. Yeah. Neil's actually also a pastor. He's a lead pastor at a church in Garden Grove. Yes. Uh, but he is also one of our uh, trainees at Fully Health Clinic. And he's going to talk to you about the next couple of topics. Thank you, Dr. Esther. All right. Well, I don't know if I have the privilege of talking about this subject <laughs> or the challenge of talking about this, <laughs> sex. Even in therapy, you know, when you're meeting with married couples, uh, it comes up, you know, and so we have a sex life in marriage, and then when your kids uh, show up, which my kids are 18 and uh, 22 years old, you have a life with them too. You know, when do you talk about it, when don't you? When's it appropriate? I asked my daughter today, I said, when did we talk about this? I forget. Um, She's home, by the way, because the fire up in uh, uh, Big Bear in, um, uh, what's the lake? Arrowhead. Arrowhead. She goes to the school of worship up there, and they had to evacuate. So our house is full of college students right now. Um, and so I was doing a bunch of interviewing with, with some of the kids. I was studying ahead of time, but it was interesting some of the, the uh, responses that I had. Um, but we always felt, my wife and I, I've been married 25 years now, that it was our responsibility to teach our kids about the God-designed gift of a healthy sex life within the confines of marriage. We always thought it was our responsibility. And um, we were also very open with our kids and did not want to leave the subject to be taboo. You know, like at where it's icky or gross or just something that can't be breached. Um, and so we, we wanted to be very open with our kids about that. We didn't want it to be off limits or something left exclusively to Hollywood or no offense to health class, right? We didn't want it to be left to that exclusively. So we wanted to kind of be proactive in breaching that subject. But it was a challenge to figure out when the right <laughs> age was and, um, and how to bring that up. And we definitely didn't want to leave that to um, uh, the peer groups. And I think our main thing was too, like let's remove the shame from it uh, because there's a lot of shame surrounding that. So we wanted to, we wanted to approach it with uh, shame off of. And also too, I think what we wanted to do as well is we wanted to not, not model it like, hey, here's how it's done, not like that. 
but emotionally, physically, and spiritually, I think we wanted to model to our kids what what a healthy Christ-centered marriage might look like. And they knew, they knew certain times of the week, even our kids now, they kind of joke about it, you know, like, oh, we gotta leave the house, let's go find something to do. <laughs> Mom and dad are gonna be intimate. Uh, but we, they knew early on that that we had a healthy spiritual life, uh, emotional life. We engaged all the time in intellectual conversations, and we had a, a healthy, physical, intimate life. To this day, our kids, they, they, they aspire to that. They're looking for that. And so because we remove the shame and the guilt and all the taboo-ness, they, there's, there's an openness there, and there's a healthiness there, we, we think and we hope. I know we haven't done it perfectly. The next subject um, that I was asked to touch on briefly is social media. And this is a tricky one. Uh, Oak Health has a YouTube channel and you could visit their channel as well. And they've done a deeper dive in this and I only have a few minutes to talk about this now. Maybe we could entertain this more in the Q&A. Uh, but this was challenging for us to navigate. Of course, our kids were coming up when a lot of this stuff was really emerging. And what we did with our kids, and it doesn't mean it needs to be that way with, with all kids, but we felt for our kids that, that psychologically and emotionally in their developmental times, that we didn't want them to have maladaptive behaviors uh, growing up. So we just, we just made the executive decision and said, not until you're 18. And I'm not saying that's for everyone, but again, going back and asking our kids, I said, how was that for you? And they said, we can't thank you enough. And I'm not exaggerating because I think what happened was their church culture uh, provided them with a way to be organic, to, to have eye contact, to shake people's hands, to meet people of different races, different genders. It wasn't curated by algorithms or, you know, they weren't put in some, some sort of box and it wasn't just throwaway friendships where you could swipe them out of your life. And so, uh, we felt like that was very valuable uh, for them. And, um, and for friendships and peer group pressure, <clears throat> this one was tricky too because uh, we've had our kids homeschooled, we've had them in private Christian school. Um, as earlier mentioned, my wife is, uh, she teaches culinary arts at a private Christian school in Huntington Beach called Bethany. Um, and then we've also had them in public school waiting for a tomato to be thrown from, <laughs> from the audience. But with, with all of those different, I guess, forms of, uh, for our kids to receive education, there, there's different friend groups involved with each of those, you've gotta understand, right? And so uh, that, was, that was interesting to navigate with them. Um, and so I think, again, with this, transparency and honesty was the best policy and uh, we try to teach them, hey, life is about choices, choices have consequences, uh, so make good choices. Uh, but we didn't wanna lead with Moses, we wanted to lead with Jesus. We didn't wanna lead with law, we wanted to lead with grace. Uh, we didn't wanna lead with condemnation, we wanted to lead with like shame off of you. And I think it was that shame off of you approach, the same that Jesus did, right? He came to a woman, in the very act of sexual promiscuity. And he said, I don't condemn you. But then he addressed the behavior, right? But this probably isn't good for you. Continue no more in this. So we wanted them to know that we're a no condemnation, no shame family. And so we provided that space of grace. And I think, I think what that allowed them to do is to be open and honest when they had curiosity, uh, rather than to feel like, we better keep this on the down low. And it's especially challenging as a pastor because, you know, there, you ever, like we're in campaign season and if you have kids and you're running a campaign, all the kids have to, you know, be, be prim and proper. We didn't want to do that. We were like, just be yourselves. People judge you, so be it. Um, just be yourselves. And so we wanted to provide that space of grace so they could be authentic and not learn the skill and the art of manipulation, <laughs> you know? So we haven't crossed all the finish lines yet, but those were, those were some ways that we wanted to cultivate discussions around sex, social media, and friendships and peer pressure groups. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Thank you. At this time, Dr. Meechan. Hello. 
We didn't both hear that I stand. You know, when I stand, I focus better. <laughs> Sometimes I teach uh, some of our uh, child clients who are struggling with ADHD. I tell them, you know, stand up if you cannot focus. If you are distracted by something else, then, yeah, your feet needed to focus. Then maybe it will allow you to focus. So I need to stand up. Because my feet has to be grounded, but I can focus you better. And I really like this small group. Usually I have a lot of speaking uh, anxiety, but not today. <laughs> so I'm happy about that as a small group. So let's have another small group next time. <laughs> let's not invite other parents. That that's not <laughs> okay, so for my topic is, how can I raise the children, emotionally healthy children? We all want this, isn't it? Right? So what's the kind of one uh, answer that you can come up with. How can we raise the resilient children? Hmm? Yeah, that is a difficult way right? because, uh, uh, again, depending on the age that we, we are kind of raising our children, is very, very complex, actually. The resilience is, is not an easy thing. When they were started to just walk, right, and then when they fell, and then we can say, oh, hurry up, you know, you know, stand up. We can do that. But the, as they grow up and then uh, going to the school, it's not easy. Oh, you got out? Okay. <laughs> Step out of it and go back again is really difficult for us to do that, right? So in order for us to understand resilience, we needed to understand in the depth. Again, this whole things that I'm going to talk about within 10 minutes is all what you know already. So, self-esteem is a very, very crucial thing. Self-confidence is a very, very crucial thing. Self-efficacy is a very, very crucial thing. And those are three things that are very kind of intertwined in some way, and sometimes we don't know how to explain either. So, I will just define it a little bit so that you can understand, and they can go back really understand how to support and encourage and enhance our children's resilience. So when they graduate from high school, from this wonderful school, they know how to really, you know, fly like the people. Yeah. Right? So, what is a self-esteem? Uh, there is a sometimes a long time, um, like about a 20 years ago-ish, or 20, 30 years ago in America, there's a self-esteem movement too. Because how can we raise our children feeling good about themselves, right? There's a, that's why there's a lot of school classes. Everybody gets some praise or some some reward, right? Because we want to boost their uh, feelings about themselves. So self-esteem is about their respect about themselves. So questions comes with like, do I like myself? Am I good or bad? So it is about their own opinions about themselves or their beliefs. So if they don't have a good opinions about themselves, their self-esteem is very low. Right? So it's a very feeling these two and a very perceptual things about their beliefs. So typically it's related to the, their value and sense of worth. So a lot of students when we see during the uh, especially for the teenagers, the body image, they're, they're not feeling really good about. And then uh, grade, right? when, when they don't get A or B, they are not feeling good about themselves. So oftentimes they phrase it, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough, is related to their self-esteem. All right, so a healthy self-esteem child, of course we wanted it to raise the children, or our children with a high uh, self-esteem. Oftentimes, the children who grow up with a high uh, self-esteem is often they are very positive. Even if they have some challenges in life, uh, even if they fail their classes, they're positive that I can do it again. Okay? So self-confidence is a different, a little different from the uh, self-esteem. It's a confidence. In general, they are trusting about themselves. Is nothing to do with their ability or capability. 
is how much they choose to believe about themselves that they can do it or not. Okay? All right. So students who or children who have a high level of self-confidence, they have this sense of control that I can do. I can choose this, I can choose that to make it myself or my life, my school, my grade to be better. So it's more of how much I can choose to trust myself to do it. All right, self, uh, self, uh, let me see. I didn't miss it. Okay, so self-efficacy. Probably this word also is very fancy word and then everybody hear about this. Self-efficacy is usually depends on a history of a previous success. Okay. So it is a belief about their own ability. So confidence is nothing to do with their ability. It's believing and trusting about themselves. But efficacy is believing about their ability, which means self-confidence is more of in general term in a many different situations and contexts. So for example, even going to school, okay, you know, I started a new school year. I can, I can do well. I can do well, so I will make uh, my uh, new friends. Uh, if the things that I'm not good at it, I will do this way and that way. So having a more of a general, their trust, I, I think I can do it. I will go with the flow with that. But self-efficacy is more of a specific. So I am pretty good at English. So I don't have to study too hard on my writing skill, but I'm really not good at chemistry. So I, my ability is weak in one subject or one area so that I wanted to improve on, right? So, but if, yes. Did you say previous hit? Uh, yes, success. Previous success. Yes, said, okay. right. So for example, if they uh, had a, uh, issues with the chemistry, for example, and then they are they failed uh, previous uh, year, but they study hard, they put effort, mom and dad put the tutors, and then they were studying, and so they did it. So that became a, one of the evidence for them, I have ability to learn. So now, oh, okay, I can fail, or maybe this new year calculus was very difficult, but I can, learn because I did it chemistry too, so I have ability to learn. So it is more of ability. So it is very important for our children to have self-efficacy. And for preparing this uh, talk that I found the one research, is quite interesting, so I wanted to just read it for you, since all of you are interested in raising your children to be resilient. This is what they said. Some of or most of our students are struggling with the procrastination, not completing their task, always doing it later, tomorrow. Let me do this first, right? So this study was saying this, procrastination has been uh, described as a self-protective strategy that makes a fragile self-esteem and Numerous studies have found a significant inverse relationship between self-report procrastination and self-esteem, which means if they have a higher self-esteem, low procrastination. So according to this study, if we raise our children with a higher level of self-esteem, believing and see themselves is good, then their even study procrastination will be decreased. And also they have self higher level of self-efficacy. Even if they fail, they can continue with what they wanted to do. So eventually they will have the success. So probably you heard about the growth mindset, right? This whole three terms, self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-efficacy are combined to help our children to have uh, growth. So again, we will have a lot of uh, uh, maybe more talk in detail, but we wanted to give you so many different things. So we're just summarizing it all these things here. 
and maybe we, I can invite all of them. No, I no? one more. Oh, one more. Okay. Okay, last section. Last section. Try as maximize this hour. Okay. <laughs> Are we going too fast for you guys? Raising our children to be Christ centered. Um, I really do like this topic, so I saved it last right here. Um, and I, with one word, it's going to be the word relationship. Um, especially the first and top priority is my relationship. My relationship with Christ. Spiritually, this is that please place your oxygen mask first before you help your child. And I, I always think about that when I hear that on the plane. If I'm not enjoying God's grace and the reality of Jesus' love in my life first, there is really nothing to relate to others, let alone my children. And so essentially, the question should be, what does it mean that in my life is Christ-centered? What, what would that look like for me? Um, is it, is it <coughs> transactional, non-transactional? Is it obligatory? Is it receiving grace and understanding that? So that's the first one. You can imagine what I think the second most important is my relationship with the other co-parent, if that's applicable. Sometimes there are so many families with uh, single, single parents. Um, but if there is a co-parent, right, this is the next one to nurture and develop regarding a Christ-centered life, a Christ-centered partnership, marriage. Um, because, you know what, children witness their parents, right, in the home every day. And they witness their interactions with each other and with other adults in the public. Oh, I have many stories I can tell you about my parents. <laughs> um, they absorb what we say to each other, right? And, and this imprinting and modeling, it will occur whether or not we plan it or want it. So, um, it's very, very important that this is the next one to really focus on. And then relationship with my child. Um, and I keep saying relationship because we get approached by a lot of parents so worried about behavior and uh, their faith behavior or non-faith behavior where I can tell the relationship is just so like kind of shattered and even if they teach their kids like how to live or what to do, it's just not gonna go in. Um, and so as a parent, I need to see my family not as a project or my possession or even my reward. Right? God has given me this family, these precious children, as my mission field. And my home is like a garden where I plant the seeds and I water it. And we parents are like gardeners. We ourselves do not make our children grow or shape them to be a certain way. The gardener creates conditions through which the power of the seed is released. That seed is Jesus Christ. And for the sake, what motive? For the sake of God's glory. And so we have to entrust the Holy Spirit to do that work um, according to his grace. And we are the stewards and the gardeners to keep on removing the weeds and keep on watering it and keep on giving it sunlight, whatever that love and grace that they need. And because we know that he's the one um, who's faithful, the one who started the work, he will be the one to complete it. So, I'm just going to end that section here. These are all your nuggets for today. Um, and we will invite the other two for Q&A.